If you are worried you have Lyme disease, or just like the outdoors, and want the peace of mind of knowing whether you have Lyme disease or not, there is a new Lyme screening test based on decades of research by Dr. Richard Marconi, a professor at VCU Medical Center. For more information, visit glymedx.com. That's G-L-Y-M-E-D-X.com. Or email at info at glymedx.com. Infectious diseases. Research. Medicine. Health. Welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. And now, broadcasting from the Outbreak News Skylar Studios in beautiful West Central Florida, here is your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Many of us have heard of Group A Streptococcus. It's a bacteria. It can live in a person's nose and throat, and it's typically spread through contact with uh, the droplets from an infected person, um, their cough or a sneeze. Uh, and there's other ways to transmit it. And you probably know a lot of the group A strep infections. They're typically, some of them are typically mild infections like strep throat. Everybody's familiar with that. Um, childhood infections like scarlet fever, impentago, which is a skin infection. And it's also the cause of some more very serious infections, um, which are considered invasive group A strep disease. And probably the two most common are, of course, uh, necrotizing fasciitis, kind of also known as the flesh-eating bacteria, and streptococcal toxic shock syndrome. Now, one disorder linked to group A strep bacteria is called PANDAS. That's an acronym, and that stands for Pediatric Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Disorders Associated with Streptococcal Infections. That's a mouthful. But... It is a pretty serious situation, and we're going to learn a little bit more about pandas now. Um, joining me now is J.C. Konechny. Uh, J.C. is the executive director for the Pandas Network. Hi, J.C. Welcome to the show. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. Sure. I'm glad to have you. All right. Well, there may be a lot of people out there that are not familiar with this, um, I guess, is it a syndrome? And um yeah. Yeah, we yeah. refer to it as a disease, but a, yes. A disease, okay. And uh, so let's go ahead and start out with some kind of a definition. What is PANDAS? Sure. Well, as you stated, the acronym stands for Pediatric Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Disorders Associated with Strep. In this disease, strep triggers a misdirected immune response. This results in inflammation in the child's brain. Um, and, and it is a pediatric illness, I should point out. And then the child begins to exhibit very life-changing symptoms, uh, such as OCD, anxiety, tics, personality changes, um, very sudden and severe declines in academic performance. We see changes in handwriting, um, sensory sensitivities. So a child who was able to wear certain types of clothing all of a sudden can't stand the touch of fabric on their skin. Mm. That would be an example. Um, Restrictive eating, uh, even into full-blown refusal of food um, and more. There, There are a long list of symptoms, but those are some of the main. The two to really keep in mind are sudden onset of obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD, or tics. So when you, say, two things. when you say tics, do you mean something like, like in the same vein as Tourette's? Exactly. So yeah. these are facial movements, uh, throat clearing, blinking, head jerking, involuntary movements. The child is unable to control them and they're repetitive in nature, just like you see in Tourette's syndrome, correct? Sure. Okay. So specifically, what is the relationship between uh, the group A streptococcus and the panda's disease? Well, I'm glad you asked that because prior to December of this past year, there was a theory about how Group A really got into the brain. And um, luckily, research out of Columbia University was just published in the Journal of Clinical Investigations. And so what this research shows is that exposure to strep over time really thins out the blood-brain barrier in some patients, patients obviously that have are affected with PANDAS. And that because the blood-brain barrier is thin or compromised, antibodies that are triggered by strep are able to cross that barrier, that protective barrier that's there um, naturally in most healthy people, 
And those antibodies create infl- inflammation in the brain, and that is where we see the PANDAS symptoms come from. Um, so now this has been proven, um, and it's exciting for our community to have you know, research that proves how the disease functions. Mm-hmm. Now, this, no, so this isn't specifically the bacteria itself. It's, it's antibodies produced by the, by the bacteria. That is correct. Yeah. That is correct. And a common misconception is that strep actually gets into the brain, and that is not true. It's the antibodies that can cross the blood-brain barrier. Very good. Now, there's, um, I noticed on your website, on the Pandas Network, um, there's also a similar um, condition called PANS. Can you explain yes. what that is? Yes, um, and we are an organization for PANDAS and PAN. So in PANS, the infectious trigger is something other than strep. Or PANS is sometimes used to describe patients who don't have strep present in their blood. This represents about 35% of people. About 35% of people who have a strep as their immunological trigger, we can't see it in their blood. So we can't prove that it's strep. Um, And again, that's about 35% of people. But other infectious triggers can cause these same set of symptoms. For example, Lyme, mold, mycoplasma are often implicated in PANS cases. And the set of symptoms is exactly the same as what we see in PANDAS. Okay. Now, roughly, how many children are affected by either PANDAS or PANS in, in the United States? You know, a lot of a lot of epidemiological research has gone into this number, and this number is from the National Institute of Mental Health, and they state that one in every 200 children in the U.S., because the number is thought to be higher globally, but in the U.S. are affected by either PANDAS or PANS. Wow, that's really a lot, and that's really surprising. So I, I mentioned to some people at, at my uh, work at the lab today that I was going to be interviewing somebody about pandas and nobody yes. nobody knew what I was talking about. Yes. <laughs> so, so it's actually pretty common. It is pretty common. Yeah, interesting. Okay, so uh, JC, what's, what's the course of the illness and the symptoms that you would see? You mentioned some of them already, but what's the course of the illness? So it's important for people to know that normally the onset is sudden and dramatic. This is an acute illness. Um, we sometimes see it ramp up over a course of weeks to maybe a month, but you're really looking for an acute illness. Um, we see a very long list of symptoms. I'll go through just a couple of them. Sure. Um, OCD or ticks, again, according to the National Institute of Mental Health, you have to either present with OCD and or ticks to fall into the diagnosis of PANDAS. And I want to point out OCD in children looks different than what we see sometimes in adults. So this isn't, it can be, but it's not just the fear of, of germs or obsessive hand washing. Um, there's a complicated way in which OCD can present in children. And I would point people to the International OCD Foundation website. They have a very good description of how OCD can present in children. Um, we also see restrictive eating. So this can be selective eating, meaning you'll only eat certain foods or full-out refusal to eat food at all. Um, and this can be for a myriad of reasons. Sometimes children are afraid that food is contaminated with germs. They may actually have trouble swallowing, coordinating their swallowing reflex. So that food is scary to them, they often choke and then become afraid to eat food altogether. Um, ticks, as we talked about earlier, same type thing that we see in Tourette syndrome, um, involuntary movements. Anxiety, emotional ability. So this is really an inability to control your response to something. So all of a sudden you start crying really for no reason or you might start laughing for no reason. This is really purely a neurological symptom. Your brain is sort of misfiring, causing really inappropriate emotional responses um, and depression we, we see very commonly in PANDAS. Now, now, do pediatricians know to look for this? You know, they don't. Not mm-hmm. nationwide. Um, we certainly have pockets of the country where pediatricians are very aware of this disease, but that's one of our goals at PANDAS Network is to make sure that if a child has strep and then develops some of these symptoms, that the pediatrician at least considers PANDAS. Um, when this happens, it's easy to treat. When you recognize that you're dealing with PANDAS early on, you can treat the patient with a course of antibiotics and steroids, and in most cases, the symptoms resolve. Um, It's just much easier to treat, as in most diseases, when caught early. All right. Just going back to the course of the illness, is there a 
as time goes on and it's not taken care of, is there an increase in severity of symptoms? Yes. So we're talking about brain inflammation here and more specifically inflammation in the basal ganglia, which is responsible for mood and for movement. So we see, you know, in some kids an, a loss of the ability to speak, a loss of the ability to walk, uh, ability to coordinate the swallowing reflex, um, psychotic symptoms, a myriad of symptoms that do progress if left untreated over time. Okay. Now let's go into diagnosis. You mentioned all kinds of different symptoms that a uh, physician or a parent may see, Um, but are there laboratory tests? Are there any specific tests that can be run for this? You know, the thing to remember about PANDAS is that the diagnosis is clinical. At the end of the day, we currently do not have a black and white test for this disease. You can look at the blood for strep. Um, We refer to this as titers in the blood. But again, keeping in mind the research out of the University of Minnesota that 35% of people whose trigger is strep, who are infected with this disease from strep, do not have titers present in their blood. So it's really important that if a pediatrician suspects this disease, that they refer out to a reputable um, and knowledgeable pediatric neurologist or immunologist. Very good. Now, uh, you mentioned antibiotics. You mentioned treatment a little bit. Mm-hmm. What What is the course of treatment specifically for pandas? Sure. So first-line therapy is antibiotics. Um, we are seeing pediatricians more and more using the cephalosporins and the macrolide class of antibiotics. Um, there is resistance in SHREP to penicillins. It's not widespread throughout the country, but there are pockets of the country where strep has become pretty virulent. So uh, heavy hitting antibiotics or heavier hitting antibiotics, I should say, uh, for a course of a month to a month and a half given with steroids is is the first line therapy. Cases that are more severe and that have gone on longer, uh, something called IVIG is used. That is immunoglobulin therapy given via IV. Mm -hmm. And this is where the immunoglobulin portion of donor blood is taken and then given to the child to reset their immune system. Um, In our house, we talk about giving good soldiers to overtake the soldiers that are confused. Um, So that's IVIG. Uh, I would say that's used for the moderate to severe patient type. And then plasmapheresis or apheresis, I think of it as almost the opposite of IVIG with the same goal, of course, removing harmful antibodies from the blood. Um, This is a costly procedure. It's pretty invasive, and it's done in the hospital. So it's taking the blood and cleansing it through a machine, uh, sort of like dialysis, to remove the harmful antibodies. All right. Let me backtrack one second, though, because... You said, sure. the, you said the first line treatment is antibiotics, but it's not the bacteria we're treating because it's, you said it's the antibody attack in the brain. Can you ex- mm-hmm. clear that up for me, please? Sure. So when antibiotics are given in the beginning of the disease, um, when if we're catching it early, so a child has strep and overnight they start to exhibit these symptoms, we're getting rid of the strep with the antibiotics gotcha, gotcha. and we're giving it in conjunction with a steroid. So we're addressing the, bl- the brain inflammation and we're addressing the strep before it has time to trick the immune system into self-attacking. Very the good. longer that strep sits around in the blood, um, the more cross reactivity with antibodies we see in the brain. Sure. Okay, that makes a lot more sense. So the, it's antibiotics is a therapy when very, very, very early in the disease. Yes, exactly. Okay. All right, uh, JC. Uh, one last thing, and this has been very informative. By the way, I appreciate you coming on. Um, Absolutely. I, I want to give you some time to uh, talk about the Pandas Network and what you yes. guys do and what services you provide and what you do for families. Go ahead. Sure. Well, so the Pandas Network is the leading nonprofit for pandas in the United States. Um, as we talked about before, one in 200 children are affected by pans or pandas. So it's a common illness. And as you stated, awareness is low. Um, so our goal, one of our many goals, is to raise awareness, to make sure that every pediatrician considers pandas or PANS when a child presents with these symptoms post-infection. Um, that it's something that is at least on their radar screen. And if perhaps they're not comfortable treating, they know who to refer out to. I would say uh, 
and another goal is advocacy, is helping advocate for legislation that allows for widespread insurance company coverage for the treatments that these patients require. Um, we are seeing increased insurance coverage, but it's not the way that it should be. Um, it's, not, it's not widespread across all providers. Um, and then I would say one of the most important things we do is provide support. Um, when families come to us, typically their children have been ill for a while and they have gotten diagnosed late or they're still trying to figure out what's going on with their child. Um, so answering phone calls, answering emails, um, providing support to these parents and patients that are in crisis, um, and also keeping a website that has really rigorously reviewed, um, we have a scientific advisory board of physicians that reviews our information so that we provide accurate, up-to-date information on our website um, that patients can really, really rely on. And then helping to fund research. I mean, eventually our goal is that PANDAS and PANS is cured. Um, so providing that money to fund research to that end so that our, our treatments can be improved and that eventually a cure for this these diseases can come to fruition. Very good. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, and, and finally, we run conferences. Um, in October, over the 15th and 16th of this coming October, we're running a conference, as we do every year, in conjunction with Georgetown Medical School um, in Washington, D.C. So interested parties should check out our website. Um, doctors can receive CME credits for attending the conference, and we also have a track for parents to become more informed about these illnesses. Excellent. Now, if somebody wants to visit your website, where do they go? PandasNetwork.org pandasnetwork.org and I encourage everybody to check this out it's a very informative website I learned a lot from it myself and I want to thank you JC Konechny uh, that's thank correct you. yeah that, that was a challenge <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> and uh, thanks for your time and expertise ma'am I appreciate it absolutely have a good evening you too Take